which was a sort of it that it in even in Germany it was always uh, going on like there were splits between communist groups where they were like okay you are too Stalinist for us we do this thing and th then they did the Trotskyist thing and <laughs> you know like we we split up every year yeah <laughs> get pure you know like this is also bullshit but um. I always have this association when I listen to like in like American sphere, online sphere, because I think the internet is also very American in a sense. Like I think all the English speaking yeah. internet. The Chinese internet is different actually. Kinda. Um but there I always feel like that it gets used in a different sense. Left. Like that it's kind of something kind of differently gets signified from how I use it. Well, yeah, like, Not to say, you know, like, yeah, it's it, it's it is totally kind of untethered and free floating. Um, and while there is still something. There's still a there there, I think. Um, the way it gets used by everybody, it is meaningless. It is, it is useless. And it does only really muddy the waters and serve to kind of like foreclose conversations b before they're even had. Um, just like the word fascism. And it, um, at least here in America, I think, I think in Europe, that's probably more of a real word. But here in America, it's, I think it starts. It's like there is constantly this like osmosis with America, especially in Germany. It's like fucking Marshall Plan was, uh, you know, <laughs> and actually what I found out when I prepared my theater text is Jaspers was part of that. Hmm. He was in a think tank um, with the FBI and the CIA. Wow. He was part of the intellectuals. And I mean, what could he do? Yeah. yeah I, I think like as a German Jew, you come back to this country. <laughs> it's maybe kind of based too, to say, okay, uh, who are the guys that I can actually trust? Probably the soldiers who defeated these guys. Yeah. Um, or the power. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, like in the Democratic Party, if we don't talk about DSA, no one in the Democratic Party would say, um, comrade. Yeah. Like, a, imagine Nancy Pelosi saying comrade to address. Yeah. Me. And with the SPD, with the Social Democratic Party, which is kind of like functioning uh, akin to the Democratic Party, they do this. They never stop doing this. You know, like at every party gathering they have, they say, dear comrades, um, what do we think about blah, blah, blah. Wow. And they're fully neoliberalized. Yeah. And so it's like, wow. I think the German radical left always had to do um, a more distinct uh, move away from the SPD. Yeah. Because it, this is the big trauma for the left in Germany, definitely. It's like you guys were the ones who put the targets on our backs. <laughs> So um, it's already, I think, a little bit more clear that if someone calls you a comrade, you immediately have to follow that up and ask, like, yeah, but in what way? Yeah. What kind of comrade am I to you? Yeah. Well, and here, here in America, it largely is, um, uh, it's LARPing. Like when people, people use that word, they, they don't even really know what it means. They just use it because they know that it signals belonging to, you know, this symbolic framework that they, they think they belong to and they think they want to belong to. Um, so, yeah, it is kind of a turnoff. I think probably for different reasons. You know, in, in Germany, it's a turnoff because, or it can be a turnoff because it's been maybe even weaponized in this way to let the, the liberals kind of disempower the leftists and here here in america it's it's a turnoff because it's like 
You're a 14 year old. Like. Yeah, and it's. In Germany, it's even a turn off because you have East West split. Yeah. And you're like someone who lived under the fucking Stasi. <laughs> if, you, if you call them comrade, they may be like. Yeah. <laughs> I learned all about that in school, you fucker, you know, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, well, I, I had a friend that grew up in East Berlin. Um, and, uh, yeah, there, there, there was horrible things that happened, um, along with the, maybe the good things, too. Like, people always want to flatten out and totalize. Um, because we're allowed to, like, we can get away with that on the internet and in here, you know, in the Imperial Corps. We aren't in any real danger, for the most part, in this way. We're still in horrible danger. We, we're still, you know, being assaulted and, and all this. And this is all true. But, like, no, you're it, in America, you're free to dress like a revolutionary and, and walk around and use revolutionary slogans and, and do all the things you want. And you'll probably get sponsored by pepsi for doing so they'll be like you're good for business and uh yeah yeah it's it's fucking crazy this is a great segue read this text hell yeah because so <clears throat> introduce introduce the text um and i am recording and and then we'll go and we'll get a little bit into it but introduce it tell tell me what it is why it matters and anything else you want about to talk about it yeah are we already on yep is this say god <laughs> okay <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> hi everyone <laughs> uh i'm here with nance i'm rudy and we are with fractured time and energy try to squeeze out some some part of our day to read yesterday's tomorrow by Bini Adamchak um on the loneliness of communist specters and the reconstruction of the future um she's a like i think neo marxist from from germany berlin and she writes akin to Fisher, or like with Fisher, I think. I don't remember if she ever really outright references him, but I, it could be the case. Um, and she's actually doing um, an inquiry into the history of the promise of communism, which we could... Also, she goes into this in the text. Uh, how is it related to emancipation? Emancipation from what? And so on. Um, and she starts with the Hitler-Stalin pact um, when uh, they actually exchanged prisoners. Um, this was the time when they still didn't want war to happen. And then she unfolds it backwards through history. So she asks the question, how could this happen? Why was this even possible? And um, what were the kernels that were already there? What uh, is it in Lenin that led to Stalin? But she doesn't do it, I think, in a um, disingenuous way. I think she really wants to try to think about communism because she takes it so seriously. She neither wants to defend it nor um, does she want to throw it away. And her big thing is like that she says, when we leave uh, the inquiry, the critique of communism to the anti-communist, then we are truly lost. Because... Um, then it is uh, always with an ideological frame which might overlook an even deeper trauma. I think that's her position, that she says, like, for, for people who actually 
still want to hold on to communism, this is even this hurts even more if you do it seriously. Yeah, um, and it th this relates to a large part of the kind of meta conversation that is going on here at Theory Underground, and I'm sh and I'm sure at all other places around the left. But like, um, who are we? What are we doing? Um. Can we do what we th think we're trying to do, or should we really dig in and and like first understand what it is we think we're trying to do before we move forward and um, you know ultimately run forward into a storm of steel, uh, as it seems like so many activists nowadays would have us do, just kind of commit to something um, and lock in onto a course of action without taking the time. Uh, I mean, shit, we've been criticized at theory underground for being too scholastic and and being too <laughs> which i think is hilarious because we're we're just a bunch of dumb assholes um but yeah this um uh, i don't know this this impetus to what seems like just self-destruction um and gl glorifying failed movements and shit uh is very convenient for for existing structures nothing really happens um, a lot of things are done, but ultimately nothing is occurring. There are no real events anymore. So I am excited to go through this book. And how could this, yeah, man. And how could this, um, actually be a symptom of something missing, missing, you know? um, and also to relate it, uh, one last thing to kind of like to broaden it or like one of the paths theory underground i think what she's doing she's kind of doing anti-communism from an anti from from a communist perspective <laughs> or like like uh post-communism <laughs> communist position <laughs> maybe yeah like uh well you know critiquing the left from the left um or doing this doing this thing where i don't want to say like admit Admit, uh, admit failure or admit defeat, but just admit, you know, you're hanging, you're flogging a dead horse and the spirit of the horse can be sublated into the new horse. Um, but maybe it's time to stop flogging that dead horse and go horse shopping or maybe not horse shopping, but learn about horses. <laughs> yeah. Let's be horse doctors. Indeed. <laughs> Um, so, do you want to start with, yeah, the forward's short, so we'll start with the forward and, and go. Um, I would uh, even start with the, the, this short little piece by Heiner Müller, right at the beginning, even before, like, the forward. Do you want to start reading, or should I? Um, I'll go, and we'll do... Um, we'll do, I don't know, five paragraphs and then switch. And then if at any time you feel the need to interject, just interject and, and we'll try to keep some type of rhythm. And of course we know the adjusted Pareto principle, 77, 23%. Cause did you know that Pareto was a fascist? The... I'm sure you've heard the Pareto principle or whatever, 80-20%, like that's this ratio where, you know, 80% of the work gets done and then the, the, the following 20% is wasted effort or whatever. And, and it does seem to prove out for the most part. Um, but the guy who observed this phenomenon uh, was one of Mussolini's homeboys. And so here at Theory Underground, we eschew 80-20, and we do the 7723 just to be idiots. <laughs> yeah. um, so here we go. <laughs> By H Heiner Müller. We who wanted to prepare the ground for friendliness, how much earth will we have to eat Oof. with the taste of our victim's blood on the way to the better future or to none, 
if we spit it out. Oof. Forward. <clears throat> this is a book about communist desire. That is, about the deep-seated moving force within people that impels them to strive to give their lives self-chosen collective meaning by opposing oppression and arbitrary coercion, abolishing hierarchical structures, and ending the various forms of alienation. The attempts to act on this desire in the 20th century were a series of colossal and catastrophic failures. What took place in the huge region of Eurasia that was once organized as the Russian Empire and then became the Soviet Union between 1917 and 1939 provides an instructive instance of the way in which utopian hopes, energies, and aspirations can turn against themselves, becoming more destructive the more well-founded and disciplined they seemed to be. How, in the face of this, can it be at all reasonable even to try to keep any kind of grip on the utopian contents of communist desire? Part of the answer, Benny Adamsack argues in this book, must lie in a reflection on the history of the failures of the communist project in the 20th century. We can only reasonably hope to retain and cultivate a communist desire for a utopian future if we understand the nature of past utopian desires and the specific ways in which they failed. Each of a series of chapters in Adam, Adam Sachs' book is devoted to exploring one historically concrete situation in which this failure became manifest. The Hitler-Stalin Pact, the Great Terror of 1937-39, through 39, the failure of the left in Central Europe to stop the advent of National Socialism, Joseph Stalin's rise to power, and Kronstadt. Adam Sack puts particular emphasis on the way in which agents in the past did or did not realize while it was happening that their commitments were turning against themselves, transforming them into their opposite and becoming destructive. The failures, the author holds, are real failures, and although much can be said about how they are to be best understood, nothing is to be gained cognitively, morally, or politically by closing one's eyes to them, pretending they did not occur or trivializing them. It is also essential to the future survival, or revival, of hopes for a better future that the work of understanding and mourning be completed in such a way as to not give succor to those who would systematically root out communist desire. I have to say, that's powerful, and that is what, when the first time you talked to me about this book, what really got me excited about this book. Um, the order in which the failures are presented and discussed in a damn sex book is the reverse of the historical order in which they occurred. The Hitler-Stalin Pact first, Kronstadt last. This is part of a conscious strategy of the author, who thinks that those who broadly share the ideals and aspirations of the major agents and victims in this story have a natural tendency to think of the history of this period in this way, looking back from the present and locating at some point in the past a moment of unmitigated good that, however past, was lost and then initiated a historical process of degeneration. The natural question to ask is, where and when did it go wrong? When Stalin signed the pact with Adolf Hitler, or already in 1933, or with Kronstadt? Part of the point of this book, as I understand it, is to reject this as the right way to understand and come to terms with what happened. There was never a single moment in the past in which an Aboriginally pure revolutionary will or unsullied communist desire was fully present and on the point of realizing itself, which then passed, was lost, and was perverted or corrupted. When you peel the layers of the historical onion back, you come not to a pure onion at the heart, but to nothing. This does not mean that an onion is not an onion, or that nothingness is the core of the onion, but rather just that one must Think about the onion in a different way. Although the above description may give the impression that this is a book of history, it is in fact a particularly admirable feature of the book that it does not fall into any of the usual categories. 
If I had to describe it, I would say it is a lyrical and philosophical reflection on history in the service of rekindling of utopian desire. Lyrical is not a word that is automatically associated with sober analysis, realism, or scholarship. This work has all those virtues, but also a remarkable lightness of touch and an unsentimental ability to enter in the mental and psychic world, worlds of those who are now dead and present, present their world, including the non-world of their unfulfilled aspirations, in a way that retains its full human vitality. Real history, the story of what did happen, and the history of utopian desire, an account of what people at any given time thought ought to happen, are not only compatible, but also require each other if we are to retain any hope for the future at all. And the forwards by Raymond Guess. Guess, guys? Goise. Yeah, that's great already, I think. Like the part about the um about the onion, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's even there's even an interesting bit because uh Zizek endorsed the book. He he wrote a piece that he liked it and he read it. Maybe he lied, we know with Zizek <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, but he, but he did say that he he's a very great book, and I think this part about Ignis is also interesting. Yeah, I uh, I th I might have giggled at that point um, about the. This is not to say that nothingness is the core of the onion, um, and okay, outside looking in, sure, but like. From my perspective, no, it is to say that nothingness is, in fact, the core of the onion, and in fact, everything else. And that made me giggle. And, and yeah, I think even that guy was playing and having fun while writing that forward. And I, yeah, I, th I think, like, when you told me about this book, uh, I got really excited. Like, I, I th this idea of, of mourning and, and moving on and honoring uh, and kind of embracing history and not falling into that facile historical materialist position that so many people will, but really, really honoring the spirit of history um, and coming to terms with it before we can posit our vision of the future. Uh, it's necessary work that doesn't seem to be in, in anybody's, you know, wheelhouse right now. Yeah, and I, I think, like, um, we'll go into this more, but, like, this, um, that maybe even the real world was lost the moment that uh, the future was lost. Now, we could problematize this and say, okay, the communists, this is what Marxists always like to do, that they are, like, we are the agents of the future. <laughs> Um, <laughs> which is also a very messianic, maybe even um, megalomaniac idea. But you could also steal man that and say, um, maybe it's also belief. Yeah. yeah. Cynical position is may is is not not better. Yeah. Uh, to say no, no. Um, I'm for nothing actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What what is the future? <laughs> yeah, I mean, even as pessimistic as he is, God does not even go that far. I think that he's like saying uh, no future at all anymore. Yeah, I so I used to, um, I used to think Baudrillard would say that but not in the sense that we're saying it now i used to think that baudrillard was too nostalgic for his own good and then i actually read baudrillard and realized no that's just a, like a stupid assumption that i was projecting on onto him like in in fact the nothingness that he 
uh, maybe posits or this irreality that he posits has always been there. So there's no getting back to it. And that's what he was saying all along. There's nothing to get back to. I do think maybe he would say, um, you know, there, there is no future. Or may, maybe, you know, the only way that we can have a future or that the future is necessarily predicated on our ability to, to make it, I do think he would say that, but that's not the same as taking just this pessimistic position. Although, um, I like to lead with the pessimistic position. I, I get my enjoyment from that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, uh, I used to do, I get my, get my enjoyment from that too. Now I'm again back to where I started when I was 15. <laughs> I like, like optimism more. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think like it has to do with um, maybe it's tangent, but I still want to bring this up uh, with Oriad that there's also an, I think he's not foreclosing that there can be an outside of linearity, which this is true, sign value, and you know, like things are, they're equal. Um, but I think he does not foreclose, although I have not read him a lot yet. But I think he does not foreclose uh, any movement. No, I think he does not foreclose movement necessarily. Or like change or like, you know, when he says, okay, maybe there has to be a catastrophic answer. And he's still saying something can end, something can die. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he he definitely, I mean, he he allows some strategies for, uh, or at least thinking about some strategies for kind of creating a world. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think he would foreclose any of that either. And it, it does suck that, I guess, the pessimistic Baudrillard is the one that everybody wants to, you know celebrate which i think it should be celebrated but you can't sit there and, and stay there like okay this this nothingness is actually everythingness and it's up to us to move for ourselves but people just take it there to the nothingness and then they kind of sit back and say oh well and it's like no you're free you're free to move because yeah, it would make it would nothingness uh, one in a sense, right? To say like, okay, I have found it. It's nothingness, so I can be a head or I can be a complete nihilist. What the, what the fuck? Whatever. Yeah. Okay, but we are reading Vini Adamchak. Um, should I continue? The first. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter one. Uh, chapter one and. In every generation, there must be those who live as if their time were not a beginning and an end, but rather an end and a beginning. This is a quote from Manes Sperber, Wie eine Träne im Ozean. Like a tear in the ocean would be the translation. The, the last warm rays of the sun expire. Not a single bird takes off from the leafless trees. Not a single wing beat can be heard. As if they have forgotten the point of flying, have lost the faith in being borne up by the air. The creatures perch on the slender branches. Slowly the long shadows of the telegraph poles once and to connect a continent to come retreat in the harvested fields. The odd forgotten blade of grass waits motionless in the winter's early dust. The disturbed woods may forages history has forgotten. It's getting dark. Just maybe, though, there's a bit of light left. 
Fleeting Night offers a glimpse of landscapes animated by unchanged fieldwork. Here and there, the dew clings to waves of grain. The first cars take to the road. And for a few kilometers, they pass alongside the railway. Something warm seeps through the tiny cracks in the vehicle. At times, the fog still clouds the view, which, even without it, would not be clear. After the day-long journey from Moscow, or further away, on to the Russian border, their eyes and grow very watching the fields, which, which rush past and yet in their immensity seem stationary. But the eyes of the German anti-fascists, the communist emigrants, see nothing. There are no windows in their barred compartment. Perhaps outside, the first patches of light are grazing the ground, while the mountains on the horizon stretch their stony heads upward into the dawning day. Or maybe it's already daytime. Possibly, even probably, it is bright out because the weather bends seldom to the history writer's metaphoric wishes. A radiant day, white from the snow on the summits in the distance, from the glittering of the white rivers, the multi multitudinous Polish lakes. The almost noonday sun stands in the otherwise empty sky, warms the roofs of the Dolipinski carriages, rolling prisons where the inmates sit seven to a car. The rattling of the train makes conversation between one compartment and the other impossible. For a time, songs are audible and encouraging words, but then, all at once, they fall silent. The wardens bring water and generous helpings of food, but now the prisoners have lost their appetite. Why now? Just eat. There's plenty of time for you to go hungry later. One of the soldiers tells them kindly. This was uh, apparently a quote from Buba Neumann. The soldiers are from the NKVD, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs. They have been ordered to bring a sealed cargo across the border. A silent human cargo. When the train slows down, the sun perhaps reaches its zenith. Nature shows itself blind to history. In the train station, the anti-fascist prisoners step out, walk on foot for the final wooded stretch. On the train bridge from Brest-Litovsk, newly established border, the road comes to an end. Other soldiers come from the other side of the bridge, raise their hands to their caps to greet the officers of the NKVD. It's also uh, referencing Buba Neumann. The names are read out. The exchange begins. Those who resist in panic are shoved, and the German soldiers, the SS soldiers, receive the Jews in their ranks with anti-Semitic pirates. And I would take a moment here to say that she's referencing, she has uh, read uh, archived works um, historical documents, and she's constantly referencing these moments. Um, certain, uh, you know, like um, uh, remembered uh, or like like documented uh, happenings. This is what uh, whenever this comes up in the text, she's usually referencing this. So are these like is this uh, like a personal correspondence or like? Um... Like, who was Neumann? Was he a soldier? Was he a prisoner? Or is that... Um, let me think, actually. She was a writer, a Germanist, 
and late was a Chris Democrat. Um, I think it's like per, from her memoirs. That was. She was. She was one of the people who was sitting in the train. Wow. She wrote that down. And that, yeah, she wrote a book. Um, she wrote multiple books. This. I think. Uh, I mean, the way that that scene she set is like very well done. It, it's she's painting a beautiful scene. Um, to juxtapose it with kind of the horror of what's happening, and and that's, I think it's very well done. I think it's very powerful. Um. But the fact that she's actually able to incorporate uh, personal accounts from from people who were there to witness it, it it's even a little more, you know, I, I could sit back and, and do my best to write a flowery scene and juxtapose it with these horrors. But actually having that connection to people that were there, it's very powerful. And it it helps you kind of remember what's at stake. Like, we're not just saying... Oh, I believe in I'm a communist because I'm a 14 year old American on the internet. Like, no, th this is real. This this kind of cements it in in the real itself. Um, what's at stake? Our very humanity is at stake. It gets lost too often. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and I think she like thing she does. She is not shying away from. Um, no, like um, Neumann, she was switched, she became a conservative. So, uh, Adamczak is already saying, Okay, I take these people serious, I'm not discrediting their account, which I think I respect that a lot. And I think she's also doing something with like how to write a text like that. She like already puts forth this like um she's not afraid to be poetic. Oh yeah. Instead of like rigorous Marxist communist uh you know which I think even Marx was often poetic, uh especially before Capital and stuff like that and Grundrisse he's like Yeah, it definitely uh Marx definitely has his moments. For sure. All right, I'll pick up a train of many trains of forgotten trains. Special, special trains in which the NKVD transport German or Austrian communists to the German border, deliver them to the Gestapo. First, on different tracks, depending on their place of incarceration, through Sheptovka and Negorlo Staubsti, Staubsti, and onto the Polish border, through somewhere in Latvia, through Austro, or through Finland. Finland. Uh, is that another quote from Schifrenic? Okay. Then, once Germany and Russia share a common border exclusively through Brest-Litovsk, -Lit the same Brest-Litovsk where two decades before Leon Trotsky met with dipl diplomats from the Central Powers to make peace, to salvage the revolution. Of the thousand deportees, embassy and secret service files document conclusively more than 300 communists. Jews and anti fascists. A multitude of transports. The first already in 1935, the last in May 1941, a month before the outbreak of the war. Uh, quoting R. Mueller and Schifranek again, and only two are commemorated in the publications of Marguerite Huber Newman. 
Neumann, and Alexander Weisberg Sibolsky in spring 1940. Most of those traveling in the trains from Russia to Germany are engineers, specialists, skilled workers whose contracts have expired and who have been released for the journey home. Some of the prisoners are National Socialist sympathizers. A number of them spies under orders from the German regime. Others, though, and these are the ones who concern us for now, are communists, mostly members of the German Communist Party or of the Austrian Schutzbund. They arrived in the Soviet Union as supporters of a revolution and most remained until 1933 or 34. Some of them left only later, after years of fighting in the underground, building and rebuilding the Communist Party, the KPD, without cease until their cover was blown and they had to escape. Many of them have been in German prisons, have suffered torture, some in the first concentration camps. They are anti-fascists. They even have the state's seal of approval, and the Soviet authorities are strict in these matters. Only those who engaged in active resistance, according to the standards of the KPD, are allowed to immigrate. Anti-Semitic persecution isn't enough to qualify for an offer of asylum. Persecuted by the Nazis, fleeing the threat of the camps, German and Austrian communists flee into Russian exile, into the Soviet Republic, the fatherland of the workers, of the proletariat, to Moscow, the reddest city on the planet. Protection is not what they hoped for most, but the chance to go on contributing to the construction of socialism, to organize resistance to Germany in exile. Very few of them mean to stay. They want to go back with new papers, with a different mission. And back they go, but unarmed, not as revolutionaries, as Soviet soldiers, but rather as their captives. They come from the labor camps, from Karganda in Kazakhstan, from the penitentiaries of the so Solovetsky Islands in the White Sea, or directly from the detention centers in Kharkiv, Gorky, or Angles, where they sit for years, awaiting trials that always proceed according to the same manner. They are shipped in from the most far-flung regions of the Soviet republics, transported thousands of kilometers, individually or in small groups. Some are old acquaintances by now, as they find themselves once more in group cells in Butir Butyrka, Moscow's central prison, where many were placed after their initial arrests a few years before. But now, unlike before, there are only 25 of them, not 110 lodged in a cell built for 25. And they sleep on beds, not on boards, on mattresses with sheets rather than on the floor wrapped in their coats. Instead of nodding off, nodding off, not sleeping, they sit in chairs, and instead of whispering, they talk loud and play games. Before, they were forbidden even to walk around, let alone sew or sing. Quoting multiple people, they receive medicine, good food, not the watery soup from before, but generous meals served three times a day. Their hunger that plagued them during their years in remand, that spurred them to force labor in the camps, is stilled on the eve of their extradition, as if the involuntary deportees should make a good impression on those who would receive them, in this way a shining, shining a pleasant light on their host country. Less, presumably, to persuade the Nazis of the humanity of the Soviet prison regime than to demonstrate the Red Empire's largesse, which is enough to spare wholesome provisions for its captives. The latter, naturally, see things otherwise. They have rather been fattened up for delivery to the German butcher. Woo! Yeah, man. And to um, think But if you, because you, just, you want to bring something up, you can go ahead, but I have two things. 
Um, first, uh, I just checked. People I think it's great if anyone, and I highly recommend it to read it on your own, count to check, because she gives, like, um, at the end, she has all her sources up. For example, um, Alexander Weisberg Sibulski was a Polish-Austrian physicist um, and also Jewish. And he was a friend of Bukharin. He wrote a book about um, Stalinist terror because he was one of the guys who, like, he had a very public trial. Um, then you have, like, every, everybody is in some way connected to communism, Soviet Union. This was what I, again, wanted to point out to, like, already say, like, she's not just uh, spurting assertions and saying that, yeah, like, this was like that. Yeah, yeah. I think she really sat down and went through archives. And the second thing is, it's, like, still, uh, after having read this book multiple times, this is so freaky to me, like, imagine, because you brought this up, Larping, these people lived in a world where there was a city named after Friedrich Engels. Yeah. A, a, a guy who, like, like, I think not even 100 years before that, um, like, uh, imagine living in a world where in America a city is called, uh, named after Hugh P. Newton. Not just, like, we give it a street, he was, you know, like, um, operations and all that, but actually renaming a whole, like, Chicago <laughs> becomes Hugh P. Newton. Yeah. Newton City. Well, we have, I mean, we have Washington here in America. Like, it's, it's that same level of, um, you know, import or whatever. Like, Washington is named after... George Washington, um, because that is what America wants to celebrate, like this, you know, liberation and the pioneers and freedom. Um, yeah, naming a city after Fr Frederick Engels, like, uh, or Alexandria, you know, named after Alexander the Alexander the Great, Macedonian. Like, you you name cities after people you want to honor. It's not just, we'll name a street after exactly, Martin Luther King. Exactly. And I mean, like, um, imagine how that, what that means for belief. This is what I want to point out. You are a German communist. The Nazis have the power. You are actually perse persecuted. Like, they, 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 you are among the first they put into their, like, trial concentration camps. Um, and you know that there is, uh, like in like, almost right next to you. I think Russia is very far from Germany, but you can make it there. It's one landmass. Um, there's a, there's a city called Engels. You know, like as as a symbol, I think that's like where I can still have like even can kind of get why people are nostalgic for this. There is something very powerful to this, and I think to relinquish it and to say, okay, let's, let's be real, um, I think it was powerful for, for these people. Yeah. As much as it was powerful for the Americans, like in the U.S., to aim the capital after Washington. Yep. You can correct me, but who who fought in the uh, uh, the war for liberation from the from the English? Yeah. Well, and and uh, looking at like it's easy when I was when I was younger, I I did fall in love with. As you said earlier, that the optimism of you know a communist future, like I Star Trek, like 
Star Trek The Next Generation. Like, that is that is communism. And I fell in love with this idea. And it is, um, you know, it is still powerful. And there is something I want. I, I do want to hold on to a utopia. Um, but we have to, like, come to terms with like hey guys like the, we like no like we we are beating our head up against a wall we're doing this wrong like you you don't have to tie the ideals you know that are way high up in the sky that you already kind of know you're never going to realize those like that's what ideals are ideals kind of guide us and we're not trying to realize them or actualize them we're trying to hold on to them as we navigate earth and life and the world and the real um but you don't have to like tie these ideals to failed movements and broken ideologies and misinterpreted structures of interpretation um but yeah like i do empathize with people i do i understand it like it, it feels good to be part of something bigger than yourself and it feels good to be part of something bigger than yourself, predicated on utopia rather than the other, right? And like communism is predicated, or at least in theory or whatever, predicated on this utopia, whereas other points of view are predicated on distinction from the other or fear of the other, or persecution of the other, defense from the other, this and that. But like, I do, I do want to empathize, but like, we need to come down from cloud nine, <laughs> And, uh, and be, I don't know, realistic about where we are today, what got us here today, and what we're able to do tomorrow. Like, we can't just blow our load on impossible, impossible movements. And even ask yourself what it is that you get, like, to put it more provoc uh, provoking now. Um after I uh, sympathize to say like, what's your parasitic relationship to this? You know, that you're like, um, oh, maybe I can get some of that sweet, uh, it's Star Trek communist. Uh, <laughs> you know, like we cannot, we are in the cynical mode. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And to, to ask the question, and I think this is what she does, is um, why has our belief led to horror? Do we continue? Okay, I read a bit. So the last thing was fattened up for delivery to the German butcher. That's how it seems, but only a few speak of it. Only a few dare to speak of what seems likely, but at the same time impossible. Among them is Zenzel Mühsam, arrested not long after arriving in the Soviet Union to spread word of the Nazi crimes of the murder of Erich Mühsam. Unlike others, she realizes she may be extradited after the pact between Germany and Russia, and she refuses to sign her deportation order abroad without specifying a destination. Better to throw herself on the train tracks than go back to Germany. Better to stay in the Stalinist prison network. She does stay in jails, camps, and in exile before migrating to East Germany, the GDR, in 1955. Her warnings fall on deaf ears. No one shares her suspicions. Almost no one, irrespective of the priv privations, degradations, disfigurements suffered at the hands of the NKVD, VD, NKVD considers, is willing to consider, Deportation to the Germans possible. Even on the train, they are unwilling to accept it. They encourage one another, vow that after setting off toward Poland, 
despite all logistical reason, they would be turning back towards Minsk, veering off toward Lithuania. They will not, cannot believe otherwise. How firm their faith must have been to go on disbelieving after years of imprisonment and forced labor in the crime about to occur. As inconceivable, almost as inconceivable as the deportation themselves, the expulsion of communists by communists, a gift to the Nazis from the hands of the Nazis' mortal enemies, so inconceivable that not even the Gestapo can believe it, and takes a large proportion of the anti-fascists, people who had often been jailed on the charge of fascist espionage, to be agents of the GPU, the Soviet Secret Service. Referencing Schafranek. Even more so, as the Germans expressly oppose many of the deportees' repatri repatriation and refused to accept them numerous times, at least until 1939. The German embassy, the foreign ministry want Germans, not anti-Germans, not enemies of Germany. They want Deutsche, the people with German roots, not Jews, the expatriates, anti-fascists. And yet they get them. To the Gestapo's great delight, 80 anti-fascists before the 1939 Hitler-Stalin pact, more than 200 out of the 350 deportees afterward. Only now do the Germans press for deportations, stressing the mutual friendly relations between the German Reich and the USSR. This is from Ambassador Friedrich Werner von der Schulenberg. I think this was a Nazi. Maybe. There's no Probably, <laughs> there's no evidence of other pressure or of any reciprocation, reciprocation follow. The Nazis give the numbers, the Soviets supply the names. The anti-fascists are sacrificed not according to some overarching principle of political calculus, nor as currency in an exchange, but rather as a kind of gift. And yeah, th let's t take a moment here because I just while I read it thought that like you could say like okay, 350 um, compare that to the size of the Soviet Union. You know, like the Soviet Union was very famous for these kind of like so-called objective um, calculations and to steel man it, there is maybe even something to it if you try to build it almost from the ground up um, and to transform um, a very a farmer's economy to an <laughs> um, industrial economy. But I think like it is a symbol that the numbers doesn't matter. It could have been 5,000 or 20. There's something else is given with the act, I think. This would I what I want to put forth. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think so too. And I, I think um I don't know. That's thinking about these numbers. I, I don't know, man. It's hard. My brain wants to stop because like what do these numbers represent? They represent people and, and like in the context of what was going on, like it was the it was the end of the fucking world for millions of people. Um and not just, you know, anti-fascists and fascists and you know, not just the people on the front lines, but for, you know, mothers and children and grandparents and like so many people died horribly and or like it's it just horrible. This was horrible. The world wars were fucking horrible. Um, and it, it's hard. It's hard even to think about those numbers. But but I do think, yeah, this is this was a gift. 
Um, and it's gross and it's hard to think about, but I would not want to have been in the position to have to think about it. Any of it. It's horrifying. Um, like people talk about IBM computers and how they kind of created the cataloging system for Hitler and, and the, their, their ability to be very instrumental and, in, and in this and that, um, Stalin and, and, and the Soviet regime was also very instrumental. Like you just said, like very good at numbers and that's horrifying. Like to say that these regimes were so efficient at just instrument instrumentalizing people and kind of reducing people down to just that number, uh, the resources they, they represent the productivity they represent. Like it's, it sucks. And I, it's hard to think about my brain doesn't, doesn't want to go there. I put up this resistance. Um, cause it's horrifying and people, people just want to, they, yeah. people want to LARP today. You know, people want to buy a Che Guevara t-shirt or buy a linen t-shirt or, you know, put up the poster on their wall, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, like, it, look, Aesthetics, it's all fine, you know, whatever floats your boat, but like, these are horrific, monstrous, inhuman, inhuman things. And to see it all reduced down, it, and even like guys on the internet, like Nick Fuentes and all those fucking idiots, like, they're just playing with memes. And like, like yeah. the, the end of the fucking world has been reduced to nothing more than a fucking meme on, on the internet. That's horrifying itself too. Like, <laughs> uh. yeah. I mean, I had one like one conversation with, yeah, I think a Marxist influence guy, communist guy, a colleague from theater, and he told me that like he had, oh, a friend of a friend told me, you know, like this kind of thing. But I, I still, I have met people like that too, that like. Um, so-called Marxist-Leninist, which often these people who call themselves that are Stalinists, because why do you have to make a cult of personality? Like actual Leninists don't do that, they just, they are Marxists. Um, I think actual, whatever that means, but like, sure, sure. Take Lenin as a Marxist, seriously. Um, and like, this guy was telling him, yeah, imagine the position that, that Stalin was in. Like this is a, this is actually a line of argumentation that people do and forth. And I don't even want to say, okay, um maybe I want to go there and say these are grounds for never talking to you, but yet again I'm in this mode where I'm like, okay, I want to try to talk people as long as I can before I draw the line in the sand. But exactly what you said, like when, when this colleague of mine told me that he was like, yeah, this was actually a move by Stalin to um, get like uh, the army running. And she will get into this because Hitler and Stalin were playing this game with each other, actually. Um, it was also a game about the phallus. Mm -hmm. um, I feel the same way uh, or like, of course, it's my, it, these are my feelings, not yours, but like, I also have this, that I'm like, this is already territory where I don't really want to go. Mm -hmm. where I want like, or not, want, I, in some sense I can't. Yep. I'm, you know, like I, I like to think maybe I would not have, maybe I would have been a true believer back then. Who the fuck knows? Yeah. Um, but I like to think about myself that I would have been one of these people who said like, okay, you really, you put these people in the train to go there. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, it, <laughs> I could imagine this, you know, like th that there are people sitting in the train, if this is correct. And there are people sitting in this train and they make like, um, they are so deep in their ideology that they, 
actually do magical thinking. Mm -hmm. This is what she says when she says it's actually not possible to drive <laughs> around this place. Yeah. And that they are no, no, we we will we'll turn around at Poland, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. Well, don't worry. We'll get there. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do like to think no windows, but I I like to think that if I were living through the through the end of the world, I would, you know, rather than try to do the self preservation, I would I would say, well, the world's ended. You know, I I. I'm, I refuse this new world that has come out of the the end of human decency, where we're all just numbers. I like to think that I would resist uh, that, but but who knows? But even yeah, going into that to that world of it, it is magical thinking, and it is just denial, and it is just I don't know. I don't even know. Is it just gratifying for the people who? For the train, yeah, the train's going to turn around in Poland. Like, are they are they somehow gratified? Is their belief? I don't know. I think it's like um, this. Is interesting because it's the question of like, um, how does the like like your Jewish source in ideology, or like what you get out of it? Um, attach to this historical materialism. Um, we're gonna move forward. I'm just a cock, and this is a good thing, actually. Not even Stalin is Stalin. Yeah, <laughs> he's also just a cock. He's the the first servant. Um, how does that actually happen? No, I think this is a way to like. Where I'm kind of like, if I'm very brutal, if I try to be very brutal to myself, and I say, okay, I just take the position of, no, I'm not the guy who steps out of the game, but I'm actually an invested believer. This kind of communist, this kind of Stalinist. Um, and I think that's how it would work. I say, of course, like, um, everything for the idea. Like maybe the jump is not so hard, you know, from like, and I, I say this as someone who really is for emancipation, but from like revolutionary belief to like, maybe it's only a small step you have to make where you're like, okay, I already risked a lot of stuff back there. Why not keep risking? Yep. But uh, we also know that uh, a lot, I think, uh, or no, we don't know, what what do we know, but um, that actually a lot of, like, the, I saw this one, I read this one thesis that, like, a lot of the people who were very trained, communists, trained in the sense of, like, educated, that a lot of them actually died in the wars with the White Army. So Stalin was left with Almost like basically kids and teens. Um, maybe the good, you know, like maybe all the good converts already were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's were left for Zoomers. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's 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 what we're left with today for the most part. Um, but. I mean, if if that were the case, you know, and if all the the true communists died, um, then obviously that's not that's not a strategy that works. Like, if you have to die to get to your destination, then then you're on the wrong road. And I think that can tell us something important. I don't I don't know what exactly, but yeah, trying to come back and do the apologetics. Relate to Martin Hagland. I think it also to Martin Hagland. You know, to say like, um, if if I if I risk everything, okay, this um, 
this makes it very meaningful for me on one hand um but uh doesn't death then in a sense turn into a fetish because you know like i already presuppose i think this is often done in um revolutionary leftist whatever the fuck um when this 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 revolution fetish where it's like yeah at least i could die for something yeah where it's like no um no we fucking need you we <laughs> need to live we are going to do this yeah. we all need to live yeah we should all make it live through this well that actually that to get very tangential that is something i've recently written a, a short piece about um this drive toward suicide um and and the, like the celebration of mark fisher and like this the celebration of all these failures um, because it's romantic to say, well, they died for the cause. And it is very romantic. And, and it's even comforting because we don't have a good world. You know, we, we have just nothing but shit. And we want to be somewhere else, but we can't get somewhere else. And there's no chance that we'll get somewhere else. Um, so it's comforting to say, well, then I'll die for the cause. That's a comfort, it, like in this. Isn't that also in a, in some sense, like an instance of slave morality? Yeah, absolutely. Like you make you make something from necessity, like okay, these people, you know, like okay, this is how history unfolded. The Tsar was such a big asshole, and Russia was so deep in shit. Socialist forces of all kinds were strong enough. Um, the people already revolted prior to this because there was no more food in parts of it. Um, and that they all had to die because this was the way the opposition between peoples and states laid out back then. Um, why, <laughs> you know, like, why make that a good thing? Yeah. Was it this paragraph? Though every detainee designated. Yeah, you just read the anti-fascists are sacrificed, yeah. not according to some overarching principle of political calculus, nor is currency in exchange, but rather as a kind of gift. Though every detainee designated repatriated from Russia is politically suspect for the Gestapo, they conclude that the majority of those infected with Marxism have been thoroughly healed of Bolshevik conditioning, and quite often they are correct. Buber Neumann describes how many of the detainees handed over and interned in German prisons lose their faith in the Soviet Union, grow convinced of a German victory, and predict a bright future for National Socialism. Oof. Some even find positive aspects in it discovering socialist traits in the economy and the workers' legislation. Already in Moscow, witnesses, witnesses, oh, already in Moscow, Weisberg Sibolsky witnesses such discussions. The prisoners in the deportee cell in Butyrka stood with the weight of both systems bearing down on them. They still feared the GPU and were now afraid of the Gestapo as well. Loose talk could still bring down the wrath of the Stalinist system. A few weeks later, excessive loyalty to the Soviets might provoke the same from the Gestapo. We had to be cautious. A GPU snitch might be sitting in our cell even then. Not to mention those who would snitch, those who had already decided to betray their fellow man to curry favor with the Germans. In these conditions, just opening your mouth was inadvisable. Still in the deportation cell, there is a scuffle between Weisberg Sibolsky and a former collaborator of the Comintern, for whom National Socialism is a form of organized capitalism 
that would pave the way for socialism. An anti-Stalinist, but still socialist Jew against a no longer Stalinist National Socialist German. I should have stayed quiet, writes Weisberg Sibolsky. Carrying on with this conversation was dangerous. The majority of the workers in the cell were smarter than I was. They chose the one correct path in this complicated situation. Silence. The workers, those unwilling to repeat what was dictated to them, say nothing. But this is not a shared silence, but a lonesome one, based on mistrust, on fear of one's neighbor. They say nothing because the things they say might be heard, not listened to, but overheard. They say nothing out of fear, but not only out of fear, it is also that they have no say, no, nothing to share. Their fate will be discussed, their destiny decided between one embassy and another, one state and another. It leaves them speechless. Well, not it, if there were indeed such an it, but rather the NKVD and Gestapo, whose enigmatic handshake implicated their very bodies. Yeah, I just got a text. I actually... Probably about another 30 more minutes, and then I'm going to boogie. Nice, man. That's more than I did a great. And these are those who will also talk in countless interrogations from bureaucratic to first the NKVD, then the Gestapo in Poland or in Germany. The la latter will divide them into groups according to the danger they represent, A, B, and C. We'll send them off to German factories and barracks or penitentiaries or concentration camps. Many are sent to their place of origin where they must register with the authorities and labor in German firms under close observation. Many, maybe most, are recruited into the Wehrmacht, and not seldom, here is yet another twist, do they return to the Soviet Union as soldiers in the war of extermination waged against the Red Army. Take, for example, the case of Erwin Jöris, though he's not an example, really not a case, but instead quite singular who is imprisoned as the leader of the Berlin-Lichtenberg Communist Youth League and remains incarcerated with, with Erich Müsa, among others, for a year in the Sonnenberg concentration camp. No is he released in his anti ground and remains there in 95 when his organization is exposed and he is forced and able to flee. First to Prague, then on to Moscow, only to be arrested in 1937 and sent back in 1938, this time to Poland, then on to Germany. After a year in remand in Moabit, he is freed by the Gestapo and recruited by the Wehr Wehrmacht. In 1944, he is taken war prisoner by the Soviets, omits mention of his first visit to the country and moreover speaks not a word of Russian for two long years despite his thorough mastery of the language. After his release in 1946 he returns to Berlin and there runs into an old acquaintance by the name of Eric Honecker whom he tells that he has lost all interest in politics. Two weeks later the NKVD arrest him on the basis of declarations he made to the Gestapo concerning the Soviet Union. He is sentenced to 25 years of hard labor in Vorkuta. Then there is Franz Langer, again not just an example, 
becomes an affiliate of a Schutzbund group, a social democratic parliamentary organization in 1934. Please, Slovakia, after the battle against the Austrian fascists in Vienna Otterkring, there joins the Communist Party. In 1938, is arrested and transported from Moscow to Germany in 1940. In June of that year, Wehrmacht deploys him. In March 1945, he manages to desert and shows up in Vienna, where he will later establish contact with the Red Army and fight with it against the Nazis and their Volkssturm units. Lunatic twists, multiple twists, which take place in utterly distinct yet not unrelated ways in the opposite direction in the lives of Soviet prisoners of war interned in German forced labor camps who were arrested on release by the N NKVD and again sentenced to forced labor, this time in Soviet camps. They are caught between the gears, immigrants unable to immigrate, flung across the continents, ground up in the gears of the great powers, the teeth of which gnash like teeth in the mouth stretched into an inhumane rictus. Not all the deported anti-fascists are freed after their interrogation to labor for the German cause or to fight as soldiers. The Gestapo's orders exclude those who were active Marxist militants prior to immigration, who engaged in political activities in the Soviet Union, who agitated against Germany or who continued to claim to their convictions, as well as those of Jewish lineage. For these people, return means to prisons and ghettos, <coughs> concentration and extermination camps. Only a few survive. The rest will die there, in Lublin, in Neuengamme, and in Mauthausen, in Auschwitz, and Bashtanek. <sighs> Man. I don't know. I keep like just thinking about real people. These are real people. They're not just, you know, words. Um, it's not just, it's not just a meme. It's not just a group where you get in black block and throw a brick through a window. Um, you know, it's, it's real, it's real shit. Like spokes in a wheel, which seem to stand still. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I like that she has that emphasizes that there's like not just not just a case, um, but it's a singular happening every time. Yeah, I think there's a a bunch of lag right now, um, because I like you were talking, but it didn't hear you until after you were talking. But yeah, like it is each time this happens, it's an event. She's dealing with each person as a as a person not just this grand historical narrative you know it's not just trends they're not just representatives um each one is a singularity each one is a human horror um yeah it's it's super powerful it's very powerful like spokes in a wheel which seem to stand still, then turn backward. Once it reaches a certain speed, these trains travel back from socialist Russia into National Socialist Germany, in the opposite direction of the sealed train that, decades before, had brought Lenin to Petrograd to wage revolution. Unceasing progress, which was meant to push history toward communism, with an inevitable leap from the first revolution in 1917, to the second, then to the worldwide one, ends here. Not halfway, how nice that might have been, 
not at the beginning, but even earlier. In the camps, almost naturally those of the enemy, but also incomprehensibly those of one's allies. Double betrayal. Betrayal of anti-fascism. Betrayal of communism. You rarely get the first without the second, and you never have the second without the first. But above all, betrayal of the communists of one comrade by the other. Betrayed to those whom they had fought against for the better part of their lives from 1918 on, who were the focal point of their political rage. Betrayed by those for whom they had devoted their lives, for whom they were willing to sacrifice their lives. Without a name, they die. Without a struggle, most of them, not at the barricades, but behind them, in Moscow's prisons, deep in the Siberian steppes back in the German camps. They counted on dying, on an early and violent death, but they did not die for revolution, not for communism, if such a thing exists. For them, there will never be any communism. There is no communism for them. There is no communism without them. There will never be any communism without them. But how are we to remember them? How do we remember those of whom there is so little left to remember? And above all, with whom do we remember them? To whom do we raise the alarm? Whom do we warn or turn to for help? How do, who do we call to in the name of a justice deferred, past due, of zealous partisanship for those the party betrayed? With whom do we mourn the lost, the murdered, the abandoned revolutionaries? abandoned in the train cars, hiding out in another country, betrayed in the concentration camps, subdued in tiny apartments in Moscow, in jail cells, in Siberian work camps. They have no allies left, no friends across the border, no fellow fighters, no comrades back home, no one who takes heart at the thought of them, no one they might think of to fire their hopes. With whom to share their loneliness? At least that at least to offer them companionship, imaginary, belated companionship. At the moment when they are awaiting arrest, for example, tipped off by the disappearance of some of their comrades, the ones who were critical first, as it may seem in the beginning, tipped off, perhaps, by the great show trials, which they may no longer be so inclined to justify as do the major communist intellectuals elsewhere, Brecht and Thicked vanger, now that, now that they have begun to fear them. Tipped off, perhaps, by the arrest of some relative, resulting in their losing their party membership, the support they received as victims of SS persecution, their job, their home. No longer do they sit in the bright new apartments, built to humane proportions, or in the big buildings on the avenues, the successors of which will receive, much later, the pejorative name of blockhousing. Instead, they sublet drafty rooms, a bed in the kitchen next to the coal oven. No more do they sit in the Hotel Lux, which housed the Communist International with comrades from the world over. Instead, they are in its backyard, in an old, unlit hovel known as the NEP Wing. The comrades, who had remained friends with them, no longer greet them. Instead, they lower their eyes, walk to the other side of the street, from contempt, above all, from fear. The, the one and then I think it's a good moment to yeah I only heard the second half of that I think it's when I turn on my mic immediately speak at dark I don't know if it I don't know if it's the mic or if it's just like a lot of lag on the internet could, I mean, it could be on my end, like, I need to shut my computer down. I don't know. Um, but yeah, once, 
once you're talking, it's it seems to catch up. So yeah, I had also problems with Wukaj while reading. Maybe it's Discord too. Switch to Google and then kind of work. But yeah, Discord was actually fucking up for us earlier today uh, when we had Carl on. It's probably it's probably Discord, dude. God damn it. But all right, yeah. We'll let you go and then nothing works. Yeah. Okay, whatever the fuck. <laughs> yeah. They were supposed to be surrounded by friends. Every neighbor a comrade. It was how they must have imagined it. At last, belonging to something more than a group of outcasts. No longer mistrustful of people on the street, of neighbors at the workbench, shoppers in the stores. No more having to hide like their comrades in Germany, Yugoslavia, Poland, Italy, the way they too had hidden not so long ago. No more reading books in secret, carefully hiding them behind glued on slipcovers. No more reassurances granted to detested authorities in public confessions. Now there hangs on the wall, or maybe it doesn't anymore, since they have already guessed their imminent incarceration and refuse once again, this time in vain, to bow down the portrait of the great comrade. Maybe one stands up on early afternoon, 1939, after sitting a long time silent at the kitchen table, goes over to the only framed picture in the sparsely furnished room, takes it down. Possibly she holds it briefly in her hand, as if looking for something, as if she believed there was something there she could find, turns it around, sets it carefully next to the sink. He no longer has the strength for great gestures of rage. Around this time, a few beams of light pierce the narrow window, fall shyly on the cupboard, on the stripes of the now completely bare wall. A white square remains visible on the wallpaper, already darkened, and a cheap coal oven with its eternally clucked, clogged flue. An angular emptiness, a free space apparently waiting for a new occupant. No one should ever have filled it. This much is clear now, far too late. The white square itself should never have been there at all. Dude, that's powerful. She's a great writer um this a damn check i'm i love it it's also powerful man i think i all i get like it's super emotional like there are some parts later where it's even harder but i think i disagree with her here <laughs> i think here there's kind of like uh, her like with the square, mm -hmm. you know? I'm like, I agree, comrade. <laughs> comrade the damn check, I agree. But we can only see this now. Yes. Well, and... This is the contingency of history, you know? Yeah? Yeah, and, and I, yeah. I think, uh, I don't know... I think that's the, a, a non-standard view where we do like everything is predicated on this contingency um, or, re, you know, retroactivity um, quilting. Like I, that's how I view the world seems to be how you view the world. It, like that seems to be how some of us view the world. And I think it's non-standard. So I don't know if I can't project that onto her um, but uh, yeah, I, I would kind of say, well, yeah, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? Like that's almost like an unnecessary little jab. Maybe it should have never been there at all. 
well, you know, that seems like splitting hairs. But I do agree that it, sh it, it goes with the, the flow with this picture she's painting. Um, you know, that, um, that hindsight. Like that, that hindsight is it's something that we have available to us now. So it is actually a tool that we can kind of use in coming up with new, new theories and new frameworks and new structures. Um, and I don't know if she's just using it rhetorically or if she really does want to sublate that into the future. Um, so I think she's wrong so. in one way, but she's only wrong if, if we take the standard view, if we take this non-standard view that we're privileged to, then she can still be right. <laughs> I think she, and I think uh, you can also read it like that. that. That that's what she actually is doing because she's doing this weird, timey thing. Mm -hmm. And she never really says it. I don't know if it's in her other book how she relates to dialectics. But there is something dialectical in her when she's like, probably the sun is shining. Yeah. <laughs> probably history is not uh, like I want to imagine it. Yeah. And so you could also say that because she is going into kind of like the heads of these people and trying to like imagine the other. Um, and that it is a move, you know, like from taking the picture down very and then she can write a sentence at the end you know the quilting point is mm -hmm. exactly this she does not start this paragraph with i should never have been in a salon on the wall but <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah like, I, I think i was a bit mean what do you think what how do you like the book so i like it um, it is, it is, I would, I would agree that it's very lyrical. Um, and I think that probably adds a lot to it. Um, I mean, I think it would be enough to just go through and recount all this stuff in a really dry, sterile way. But I think putting it in this very beautiful way i think it, it it'll it would help it reach other people um and maybe even people who don't normally read books about marxism right like i i could see this appealing to i don't want to say normie normies but more normal people um than i, I don't know just a book about like i'm a communist and there was some bad shit but you know comment like like, I, I think she's treating it very delicately, very purposefully, and very deftly. Um, and I think it's a conversation that, that people shy away from. Like, people just want to cling to this, this idea of communism. Um, and they don't ever want to tear you with the negative. Um, and we, of course, we have to because we really do want a future and we can't get to the future until we make our way through the history that's that's blocking the road right now so i love it it's almost like it's almost like she does an obituary yes I just thought no like i can really see her standing the, at the grave of the dream and re reading this out yeah and i think this is like for me this is the the communism i affiliate the most with mm -hmm. like that that like um because i think there's also something very very fearless in what she's doing yeah um, but she's showing all these, um, like, you can read this in parts, like, about, like, even, like, translation, 
like the times when it's like you can short circuit part when she's speaking about like overheard not listened to but overheard yeah that's for example that is a amazing formulation i think um where she's doing I think, something more philosophical as it appears at first like how she uses words and turns them around you know mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, 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 I love it too. I love it too, and I really want to see people um, kind of like my uh, limitness test. Mm. If people can tarry with this. Yeah. And I think, like, this is the best version of communist thought today. Yeah. Like one of the best versions, and and people who are like, yeah, there were some bad things, but who knows? Maybe yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like, like I often like like especially on left tube or whatever, like the uh, and and also from Marxists, um, often it gets kinda into hand wavy territory. Yeah, uh, which comes with the medium, you know, it's also internet shit, but uh. Sometimes when I watch them and even when I engaged with them, I was like, yeah, but let's sit, sit a little bit longer with this before you invoke, uh, but the means of production have to be seized, you know, like. Yeah, they, they talk about, you know, the, the necessary progress and, you know, the arrow of history. And um, that is just a way to hand wave. It's not just all these horrors and, and all this monstrous inhumane shit, but it is failure. It is fucking, it, it's failure. And they just want to cover up the failure um, and say, no, this is the way it has to be because somebody else said so many years ago. Um, and it's very unserious. But this is a very seemingly serious look at this thing that she cares about. And she's like, I want to understand this because I do actually care about it. I'm not just here to be long. I, I'm here because I, because I believe in it. Yeah. 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 Kind of akin to like what what um, even Daniel Daniel Garner said in one live stream, you know, about like belief and like if you're uh, like. I don't want to misrepresent him, but like that if you're a serious Christ Christian or really trying to believe, you should talk to the non-believer, uh, talk to the uh, the atheist, the heretic, ask them why don't you, uh, you know, like don't quilt too fast. Yeah. And on belonging, it would be really interesting. I really want to read the whole book with you because I think she builds it at the end beautiful. The last chapter is amazing. This is why I love the book, why I don't like it, but I love it. Hell yeah. Well we'll uh because she's not afraid of belonging. I uh yeah we'll find time. Hopefully hopefully we can find some time um over the coming month because I do want to finish it with you, and I don't want it to take forever. Um, but if we don't, yeah. if we can't find the time this coming month, then when, I, when I'm back, then we'll just bang it out. Because either way, yeah, um, this is great. And it relates to so many... <laughs> It, it's so many of the conversations we've had. In Berlin. Yeah, or you could do that too. Yeah, Ride a train to Berlin. <laughs> I, uh, in New York, I, I was reading, uh, Marshall McLuhan on the subway. So in Berlin, you could hijack me and we'll read Adamsik on the train in Berlin. <laughs> Maybe we find like a East German train track. <laughs> yeah. <if we> can. <laughs> right. That would be perverse. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, we'll get it done, and it it's it's related to many conversations we've had, the two of us, 
and the two of us, along with other people that that have kind of been going on. And Dave and I have also been talking about this. Um, he wants to read anti-Bolshevik communism. Um, and I think this goes great with that, too. So I think this is a, a great addition to to our developing milieu. Yeah, and I don't know if if I think it serves as a great litmus test. If you can't stomach this, um, then you're doing something wrong. Get out! Get out! I yeah, mean, come on, man. Yeah, like I think this is not even. Uh... This is not even dualistic, vokey, or whatever the fuck. Like she's just sitting down and trying to think through something. Like you, maybe this this is a little bit too um, uh, aggressive on my part. But like you have to be a mega ideologue to hear this if you are left adjacent, whatever the fuck. If you care about emancipation and you hear this and you go into you get triggered yeah like i think she's very soft and beautiful mm -hmm. as nothing edgy yeah <laughs> i think she's the, the the exactly the opposite of um edgy triggering she's not provoking yeah it's very loving very gentle very kind and caring and humane um, yeah. I love it. It's great. 